Hi and welcome to episode 10 of Metastatic Modernity. I'm Tom Murphy and in this episode we'll deal with a typical bargaining plea in response to ecological bad news of can't we just ditch the bad stuff and keep the stuff we like? This is our next stop on the journey to put modernity into context. So the trappings of modernity. Um, trappings indicate superficial outward signs of success, the bells and whistles, the conveniences, conspicuous consumption, it also has the word trap right there in the word, um, alluring perks with hidden costs. Modernity turns out to be something like a monkey trap where we've grabbed the banana and we won't let go, even to our ultimate detriment. Now, when I suggest that modernity will prove to be a failure on ecological grounds, it trips a circuit breaker for some people. I mean, am I proposing that we return to the Stone Age? The thought of all those lost benefits can trigger a response of anger. So let me be clear, I'm making no proposals. I'm pointing out that modernity isn't ecologically sound and that we don't have the power of choice to maintain something that is fundamentally unsustainable any more than we have a choice to rise from our seats in defiance of gravity. We live in an anomalous period of rapid inheritance spending accompanied by a drawdown of ecological health and it's conditioned us to falsely believe we can do anything we want that it's a simple simple matter of choice. Um, as a result, we find ourselves in this kind of temporary fantasy world where our mental models don't match the broader reality. And the excess of this moment makes us poor judges of what's possible in the long term. So I built this incomplete table of our likes and dislikes. You could certainly add more items the two sides are independent lists, by the way, that don't correlate row for row. Now, political efforts tend to center more on the positives and less on reducing the negatives. I mean, what do we want? Perks. When do we want them? Now. So campaigns just work better on positivity and promises than addressing and eliminating negatives. That's one thing to be aware of. So, hey, I have an idea. I'm sure nobody's ever thought about this, but... You know, if nobody wants the bad things, let's just get rid of them. Seems like a no-brainer, which is precisely what it is. Obviously, given the pressing nature of the negatives, this has occurred to people before, and if it were easy, we would have so been doing it already. Um, and when something is this important, it's important not to be glib and be suspicious of, you know, unexamined, can't we just, proposals. In any case, let's entertain this proposal for a moment and say that we became fully committed to eliminating the things we dislike. The result would be, oops, um, all the items in the like column go away as a consequence. We simply don't know how to have one without the other, or as I said, we'd already be doing that. The dislikes have stubbornly remained problematic uh, despite major concerns for decades or even centuries. They just aren't going away. Our culture, meanwhile, has instilled in us a frightening degree of technological faith that our brains can do anything with no limits. And I just want you to pause. I mean, can you hear the delusion in that statement? Yet it, it surrounds us. We're, we're immersed in that kind of mentality. So we have to face it that, you know, the likes and dislikes go hand in hand. They're a package deal, two sides of the same coin. And if we don't like the backside of a coin, can we shave it off? No, it's still going to have a backside. And if these likes and dislikes are inseparable, then liking the likes amounts to liking the dislikes. Or if you prefer to dislike the dislikes, you effectively dislike the likes. You have to pick a team. You accept or embrace the dislikes as part of the likes. Or, you know, be prepared to set aside things you thought were good because in full consideration, they're actually bad on the whole when considering the full context. Now, we've been well-trained to isolate, reduce, simplify, decontextualize in order to make our problems tidy and tractable. But that approach doesn't serve us very well here. If these things are inseparable, um, you know, these the statements I said before are true, but that might trip some people up and be less than obvious. But here are two points. First, we have no evidence that 
we could separate the likes from the dislikes. And we have a world of evidence that, you know, it's, it's pervasive that those things are connected. And the second thing might sound condescending, but I'll say it anyway, wishing them to be separable has no effect on the reality of the situation. And the situation is asymmetric, that you got ecological health on the one hand and human material comforts on the other, and the one needs the other, but not the reverse. Um, it's not actually a choice. You can't have human material comforts without a healthy ecological foundation, at least in a sustainable long-term fashion. This mess of a diagram is something I threw together quickly to help illustrate the inseparability of the likes from the dislikes. Likes in green on the left and dislikes in pink on the right. Now, I wouldn't call this diagram perfect, but each arrow does represent some explicit connection with some rationale that's reasonable. The blue arrows are dependencies or requirements, and the red arrows are products or outcomes. In order to eliminate a dislike, you'd have to locate any of the arrowheads pointing to that dislike, and it has to go, which means that the arrow has to go and the thing connected to it is impacted, which cascades all the way back to the likes. So, for example, eliminating deforestation works back to agriculture and mining and then mining impacts energy manufacture medical transport and all the things that depend on those which turns out to be everything uh, notice by the way that climate change looks like the easy one here it's only got one arrow going to it and it's a dashed arrow only some forms of energy are responsible and that's part of maybe why it's a focus because it's one of the more tractable of the dislikes. Also note how many roads lead to biodiversity loss and extinction, which is worrisome. Okay, so imagine that you are making the case for one of your likes to a board representing a biodiverse community or club of life. Let's say you want medical care, and so you're asked to uh, kind of evaluate the costs and the benefits. The benefits are, you know, Longer human life, a larger, healthier human population, greater potential for innovation, market engagement. The costs, well, mining, energy, waste, chemicals, pollution, and a host of all those ripple effects as per the previous tangled diagram. The board says, okay, well, how does this benefit the whole club of life, not just humans? And you say, well, you know, we are members of club of life, right? The board says, yes, but, you know, in your present mode, it seems your proposal would be a net negative. I mean, you know, we're all in this together, right? Humans are not separate from the club of life. Humans can't always win in the short term at the expense of the rest because, you know, that's a sure way for us to all lose in the end, including yourselves. So I know that I'm basically suggesting that because of the inseparable nature of the ecological harms to the things that we like and cherish, um, that we'll need to set aside a lot of our comforts. And that's a very tough sell. I mean, I get that. I'm not about to run for office. We know how that would turn out. Um, but we've been working toward unrealistic goals. They're short-term, they're unsustainable. They have no long-term future. Um, and it's not that we're fundamentally rotten. We're just conditioned by our culture to want inappropriate things things that are, you know, not of this world. They have no permanent place in an ecological context. Deathbed reflections seldom focus on material things that people had or wish they had, but more on relationships that they had or wish they had. And we can focus on those things in life. So the things on this slide can be deeply meaningful and rewarding without necessitating all those dislikes because they don't involve materials, energy, waste, pollution in the way of modernity. And importantly, we've managed it before, in fact, for most of our time on this planet. Now, I'm not delusional enough to imagine some biophysical detachment. We're still members of an ecological biophysical community. I'm simply suggesting that we might pursue more ecologically normal needs. Okay, that's it for this time. Next time, we're going to take a deeper look into why renewables and recycling are not the solutions to get us out of this mess. And until then, as always, I encourage you to look at the written companion to this episode at Do The Math blog at dothemath.ucsc.edu. Okay, until next time.